If you will, take your Bibles tonight and ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And then also we'll be looking at a few verses in Matthew chapter 19. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 16. Let's begin there, and we'll read down through the end of that chapter uh, with verse 18, and then let's skip over to Matthew 19. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's begin in verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then if you would, go over to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19, and ask you to look at verse number 27. All right, Matthew 19. And if you would, please, verse 27. This is following the rich young man that leaves Christ sorrowful after being asked to give all that he has to the poor. And he says this in verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me, and the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one, verse 29, that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And so tonight I want to continue looking at reward, how to be an award-winning steward for the Lord. Let's pray and ask God to help us tonight. Lord, thank you. For the joy it is to be in the midst of this month, God, as we uh, plan and as we strive to be better stewards for you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for this dear brother that's with us tonight and the call that you have given to him and the mission field that you have laid upon his heart. And uh, we pray you bless him and help us, Lord, to be an encouragement to him even this evening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing us safely here. And Lord, again, we think of those that uh, are in the midst of sorrow and Suffering right now, we think especially again of the Bidlands this evening, that, Lord, you would be with their family. Give especially grace and comfort to Brother Andy tonight. And, that, Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as a church on how to be a minister uh, to him and to encourage him and to shoulder with him, Lord, this difficult time you've brought into his life. We thank you, Lord, for the peace and joy that comes through Jesus Christ. And Lord, with even recent events in our lives and in our families and in this world, we're reminded of the brevity of life. We're reminded that we will answer for how we steward every moment that you entrust to us. And I pray tonight, Lord, that you would prepare us and position us, Lord, to use what time we have left to accomplish your will, your way, so that, Lord, we might hear someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bless our study tonight. Help me to be a blessing and encouragement to these dear folks, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I read the other day a statement. Someone said this, and I thought it captured my own view of my resources. Someone said this, money comes like a turtle and leaves like a rabbit. You have that experience in your own life? It's amazing, you know, how you look at your wallet or your purse and nothing comes there very quickly. But man, if there's anything ever there, it's, it's gone, right? Just... It disperses. And if you have children, you especially value that statement right there. It doesn't go like a rabbit. It goes like a little kid with you know, all of their desires and plans to spend your money. But money comes and goes uh, so quickly in this life, and so does every other resource that God has entrusted to us. The statement I gave you two weeks ago, and I give it to you again. If you didn't write it down, I would do so. If you did write it down, you may want to write it down again. Our outline's on the back of our bulletin tonight. If you would like to follow along. But here's the statement, and I would encourage you to think on this and write this down. It is okay and is important to be motivated in our stewardship by eternal rewards. It is okay and important to be motivated in our stewardship by eternal rewards. 
And we've been talking about this the last two weeks. You know, it's kind of like we want to be super spiritual, don't we? And well, I just, I just love God and I just want to do God's will. And that's good. But God has promised us rewards. He's, he's offered to us rewards. And I just think that we might, uh, should pursue uh, achieving and experiencing and being able to give greater praise and glory to God in eternity as we experience those rewards. So the question tonight is, how do we allow those rewards to motivate us? How do we allow those rewards to affect how we do stewardship in the life that we have left? And we've looked at several principles. We want to look at two more tonight. Number five, a believer is a person and a steward that's properly seeking to please God is one who believes in smart investments. Smart investments. Have you ever thought you're being smart and you're not quite as smart as you thought you were? I saw the other day a picture on Facebook of a grandpa. In fact, uh, his brother Jenkins, who pastors the church that my in-laws are members at uh, up in uh, Columbia Road Baptist in North Olmstead, And there was a picture of, of brother Jenkins sitting on his lazy boy chair. And the perspective of the camera was kind of down below him on the floor. And you could kind of just see his head. And he's kind of laughing and smiling. And all you could see were his stocking feet white socks, and then his little grandkid, his, his little boy is sitting there beside him, like you could tell he's kind of laughing and smirking, and there was just this little slogan that Brother Jenkins' daughter, this kid's mom, put there, said, things are not always as they seem, and here Grandpa thought Junior was just tickling his feet, and you look at the bottom, and there's permanent marker, like, like all kinds of drawings on the bottom of his feet, and Grandpa's just laughing, you know, the cute grandkid who's destroying a perfectly good uh, pair of socks. You know, a lot of times we think we perceive and we know, and yet if we're, if we're not careful, we're pretty dumb, we're pretty foolish when it comes to how we invest the little bit of life and resources that God gives to us. And so we need to be careful in that, and we need to make smart investments, wise investments, based upon what God has given to us. See, obeying God is not just right, it's smart. And I find it fascinating in the Word of God that God does not just appeal to the virtue of proper stewardship. He appeals to our desire to be wise and not to be fools with the things that we have. And so we can this evening not just allow God to appeal to our desire for spirituality, but our appeal of common sense. A couple things I give you. Would you go back to our text in 2 Corinthians 4? We'll come back to the Matthew 19 in a moment. But can I just give you a couple principles that come to us through this uh, these last couple of verses that should elevate our view uh, of not just the temporal, but of eternity. Look again, if you will, at verse 16 and also verse 17. First of all, a believer who uh, is stewarding properly believes in smart investments, first of all, by looking for that which has great potential. When you're investing, you're not looking just to get a buck for a buck or an hour for an hour, or some of your life for some other life. You're seeking to reap dividends, right? To get more than you have, more than you invest. And so when it comes to God with all that we have, we should be looking for great potential. Look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And I, and I try to... <laughs> be brief tonight in the, in the illustration, but I walked in this morning and one of the things that first moved me was looking at our hospitality table that Miss Joanne has managed now for several years here in our church. She can't do it anymore. But can I tell you, there's something about just taking stuff, the potential of that, moving cups around, putting coffee in a, in a bin, ministering to someone. Brother Nathan was out, I think, for hours today shoveling snow. It's taking common manual things and knowing we can do something with that for eternity. See, there's potential in stewardship. And our little bit of life and our little bit of stuff and our little bit of ability, God can take that and use that. And so as we're investing, may we do so with wisdom, looking for potential. Now, what does that do for us when we're investing in that which is lasting? If you look at verse 16, he says, though the outward man perishes, yet the inward man is renewed. And so as we invest in that which has great potential, first of all, number one, it renews us. Man, you get tired, you get discouraged, you feel like, man, is this really worth investing my time in? I mean, good night, we're at a level what? Again, here in Wayne County, I think we're at a one. Ooh, that's scary anymore, isn't it? 
You know, it's at least got to be in double digits to even get my attention after this winter. But we're here and we're, we're giving. Is it worth it? Remember the potential of what we're doing. And let that renew you. Paul said, listen, though the outward man is crumbling and perishing, yet the inward man is renewed because we're involved in something. We're investing in something that has great potential. I don't know if you've taken any college classes or not, but if you have, one of the first things they will give you when you go into the class, you'll sit down, is they will give you what's called a syllabus. And in that syllabus is basically just an overview of the course, what they're going to teach, I really don't pay much attention to that. All I want to know is what do they expect of me? What's going to be graded? What's the, the value system of this class? And what do I need to make sure that I do? Do you know that God reveals to us what He expects of us? What's going to be evaluated? What can be blessed? What God could do with what we little we give to Him? Man, that reality should drive us to the Word of God, which is, by the way, God's syllabus, where He tells us, you do this, here's what happens. You yield here, you give here, you sacrifice here, and I will bless and I will reward. And so there's great potential. And a steward that's doing what he should or she should is looking for smart investments that give great divine potential. Now notice secondly in verse 17. Paul goes on to say, lest we think he's living in kind of a pie-in-the-sky kind of existence, he says this, for our light affliction, all right, let's be real, we have affliction, but our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal, I like this next word, weight. Weight of glory. Number two, not only is there potential in that we are renewed by, but also we know there's a reward that is coming. There's a reward that is coming. Why are we so fearful of death? Why are we so worried about this life being terminated or altered or changed when we're, we're talking about the best thing there is? A place of reward. If nothing else, we get God. We get His presence. We get to hear from Him and see Him and fellowship with believers that have preceded us. What a, what a joy that is. What a reward that is. But may I remind us this evening that our rewards are directly correlated to what we do for God in this life. Um, it's worth it to work for God right now. It's worth it to invest. It's worth it to give of ourselves to the Lord. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed sporting events, but sometimes at the last second, you know, one team's down by a point or a goal or a field goal or whatever, and, and the team will scramble to try to get an open shot, whatever the sport is. But sometimes the buzzer goes off, right? The light and the clock goes to triple zero, and then the shot is given, or then the ball is kicked. Doesn't count, does it? Do you know there's coming a moment where there's, there's nothing else we can do? to be ready for this moment of reward. That's not a negative thing. That's an encouraging thing to do right now, everything I can for the Lord, because there's coming a moment where it's triple zero. There's no time left. And as we found this week, it can come suddenly, can it? For any of us. I want to be found given my all for the Lord. What little I have, I want Him to have it all because of the great reward that God offers, not again for our glory, but for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. I think if we're not careful, we are selective when it comes to second chances. Would you not agree tonight that we believe the Bible teaches that after death, a person gets no second chance if they're an unbeliever, right? That there's no purgatory, there's no in-between limbo, someone can buy you out, pray you out, somehow you yourself can get out. It's over, right? At that moment, your destination, somewhere forever, has been settled. That's sobering. But may I say also, there's no second chances for believers after that moment. Death, that's it. Now we have what rewards we have. Now we have however God has used us and we've let Him use us. And in that moment, our rewards have been tallied. And so we must be driven and motivated to invest in that which has great potential. It renews us. It keeps the reward of God ever before our eyes. Now secondly, look if you will down at verse 18. There's a second aspect of our evaluation of what is a smart investment and what is not. And it's found here in verse 18. Notice Paul says this, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so our perspective changes as a result of 
a right stewardship. And here's the second principle we look for. All right, say, Pastor, how do I know what to invest my life in? First of all, look for divine potential. Where is God promised and connected some kind of powerful, unbelievable promise? Uh, start investing in that. But number two, uh, we're looking for placement. A place where it will not corrupt, it will not fade, it will not in any way be contaminated or diminished by this life. And the factors that ruin and, and rust the things that this world pursues. Have you ever had a moment where you're about ready to look at your checking account and then you don't just because you don't want to see how much money you don't have? Have you ever had that? You just, I mean, you know it's, it's pushing the triple zero, going back to that for a moment, and you just, it's like, it's denial. It doesn't change the balance. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't push back any of the bills or withdrawals that are about to happen. It just is. But sometimes we're in denial. Can I tell you tonight, many of us in the room, we've given very little thought to the balance being carried over into eternity from what we've done for the Lord. Now I'm telling you, it's by God's grace alone. Understand that. But if you thought about what's there, if you thought about what could be there, what, can you put a price on a soul that you're able to lead to Christ? Can you put a price on investing and pouring yourself into the life of another as you disciple? There's to be placement, wise placement, as we steward for the Lord. A couple things I give you underneath of that that I think help us in this area. Number one, it gives us a proper focus. Did you notice that in verse 18? He says, while we look not at the things which are seen. And then he says, we look at the things which are not seen. There's a focus that comes when we're where we should be in this area of stewardship. I've told you before, whatever you give to, you now have a focus upon, don't you? It's valuable to do. You've invested some of your time. You've invested some of your talent. You've invested some of your treasure. I was at a church planning conference this past week over in Chicago area, just south of Chicago. Brand new church planning conference. They never had one before this local church, not a real large church, just a little bigger than probably our church. But they had several hundred people there at this conference. Church planners from all over the country. There was a guy going to Seattle, Washington. According to him, I didn't check all of his numbers, but just a handful of churches in the whole area of Seattle. One guy going to Los Angeles, and a lot of them were inner city type of church planning. Guy who just started in Cincinnati and some other places. And, but it was just awesome to see their value system. That to be honest, even was a little different than mine. If I get, had my druthers on planning a church, I'd plant another one in a city like this. I, I like aspects of our county. But inner city work and the faith that they demonstrated and the focus they had to do what God had called them to do. As we were talking about this morning, when we look for proof from God or we look for excuses for our flesh to do what we want, our simple sight misses the much that God can do with us. May we have a focus that comes through stewardship. Second, look at the end of verse 18. He goes on to say, why do we look like that? Why do we not look at the things which are seen? That's hard to do, isn't it? and to look at the things that are not seen. Why do we do that? Notice he says, for the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. Number two, not only does it give us a focus, but number two, it reminds us of the forever that is to come, the eternal aspects of our relationship with God. The forever, as we talked about last week, the long tomorrow, as A.W. Tozer defined it, that lasts and lasts and lasts. Now, do we in our church believe in prosperity gospel? Do we teach that? Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Someone said this, prosperity theology, which, you know, health, wealth, and prosperity, that that is what should be the reality for every obedient Christian. But an individual said this, prosperity theology gets it right that God rewards faithfulness, but gets it wrong when it comes to the location and timing of those rewards. It assumes wrongly that the rewards are here and now. While Scripture teaches us the greatest rewards will not be here and now, but then and there. And that's what we're investing in. And that's what we're giving to. And that's what we're sacrificing is for the forever, the eternal rewards that God has promised us. My boy Ian, who's sitting over here. Uh, did you guys do okay today, Brother John? 
he watched our boys this afternoon, and uh, I, think, I think they had fun, had a good time. In fact, as they were leaving, Brother John said, oh yeah, we'll have fun. I said, I don't know if I want you to have as much fun as you define fun as. This guy guts deer in his backyard and has a blast there. But uh, anyway, our boys were there. Ian, we were having a conversation the other day, and I was telling Ian, I said, Ian, um, we were talking about going to school, and I said, I would walk to school, even in the winter. I didn't say uphill both ways and five feet snow like some of you, but I said, we would walk to school. Didn't matter what the, if we had school, we would walk. It wasn't that far, but about a quarter of a mile, or t- I think I said four miles to him maybe, but it was about a quarter of a mile. <laughs> and uh, so we were having this conversation, and he, there was a pause after I said that, and then he said, oh yeah, that's right, you guys didn't have cars back then, did you? <laughs> I said, how, how old do you think I am? I mean, I know I'm getting up there in years. Do you know how much of our life passes? It passes so quickly. You know, may not be as old as you think, but I can tell you you're more fragile and more frail and closer to eternity than any of us would be willing to admit tonight. And if we sense that and we're not sobered by that in, a, in an immo- immobilized way where we're just frozen or stuck, but we're driven, we're motivated to be what God wants us to be. I mean, we can be stewards for the Lord that God can use in a great way. I read of two men that were farmers, and their farms ran concurrent with one another. The main fence line was shared by these two gentlemen. The one on one side of the fence was a bitter atheist. The other, a devout Christian. Constantly anointed the Christian for his trust in God, the atheist said to him one winter, he said, quote, let's plant our crops as usual this spring, each the same number of acres. You pray to your God, and I'll curse that same God. Then came October, uh, then uh, will come October, and let's see who has the bigger crop. When October came, the atheist was delighted because his crop was larger than the Christian farmer. He said, see you fool, what do you have to say for your God now? There was a brief moment of pause and the other farmer replied, he said, my God does not settle all of his accounts in October. You know, I think we forget sometimes. The tally's not done yet. David had that problem. I I was almost in complete wickedness as I saw the wealth and prosperity of the wicked. Then I remembered their end. Don't forget our end as well and what awaits us as we're faithful for Him. It's worth it to raise your family right. It's worth it to serve God. It's worth it to witness. It's worth it to give. It's worth it to give your all to God. It will pay. And for those that say otherwise, we don't have to argue with them. Use the Word of God, but let's just wait and see how it all works out when the Octobers of this life are done. And we stand and we give an account and by the grace of God, we receive reward that abounds to the glory and grace of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you tonight to believe that being a steward for God is a smart investment. I don't care what the world says or even carnal believers. What does God's word say? He says it's a smart investment. Now, secondly, if you will, go down to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And we've been, I don't know if you've noticed this, but the last few weeks we've been dealing with dialogue between Christ's disciples and Christ about different issues. Uh, last week it was Peter with his fear, you know, his, I just, I failed God and wasn't willing to come back to Christ on his own. Then we talked about Thomas this morning. Well, now we're back to Peter in a dialogue he had with Christ. And if you will, look here in Matthew 19 and notice this conversation that took place that gives us the second principle tonight that we must believe if we are to be proper stewards. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Number two, secondly, not only does a steward who is properly on in the Lord believe in smart investing, and that's why they steward properly, but number two, they believe in levels of rewards. Levels of rewards. Now, this may bother you tonight, but I think many of us are a little bit socialistic in our spirituality. Well, brother, all ground is level ground at the cross. I understand what's meant by that, and I agree with that. Heaven's open to every sinner, even if it's the last moment, and they receive Christ and genuinely put faith in Him alone. All of that is true. But I think in that same Bible, it is clear that not every Christian will hear well done, right? Do you believe that tonight? Not every Christian will hear the two words, well done. 
Not all Christians will have the same treasure in heaven. In fact, some, 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 3 says, will have no treasure uh, in heaven. Not all Christians will have the same position in heaven. Not all will have the same rewards. And there is no hint that that initial gift or lack of gift in heaven will ever change. It's not the first couple hundred years those that have rewards have them and others don't, and then everything's kind of redistributed and now we're both back where we started. Those rewards last. That place of blessing and opportunity to serve God last and last and last. And so a steward who invests properly believes that there are levels of rewards. A couple things about that I gave you found in our text tonight. First of all, number one, that person believes in proportion that God rewards proportionately to our sacrifice and service for Him. I saw the other day a, uh, a, a bumper sticker, and it said this, quote, if a dentist makes his money off of unhealthy teeth, why should I trust a toothbrush and toothpaste that four out of five dentists recommend? Have you ever thought about that? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm their business. I'm their bread and butter. I'm their job security. And they're telling me this is the right toothpaste to use. I don't know, maybe there's a conflict of interest there. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we doubt God's goodness and we're, is He after my stuff? Is He after my time? Or is there something more in play than just that? Now, for sake of context, we don't have time to look at it, but would you just glance, kind of run your eyes back through the beginning or I guess the middle of this chapter? And you see he has this conversation with a rich young ruler, right? And I think if we're not careful, we focus just on Christ and this rich young ruler. But while they're talking, the disciples are watching this whole story. And they're thinking, okay, Christ said this to this man, and yet he was unwilling to sacrifice. And now on the heels of that, Peter then says in verse 27, well, we've given all. What will we have? What will we receive? And I think it's interesting to note that Christ does not rebuke Peter for his question. He answers it, and he gives specific rewards that will come to those that sacrifice all. A couple things I give you very quickly. What does God give to us proportionally as we sacrifice for him? I believe, first of all, he gives us authority. Did you notice there in verse 28 that he says, or actually, yeah, verse 28, he says to Peter that they, these 12, will sit upon thrones Notice, and will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. I believe the disciples will have a special place in the kingdom, the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, and they will rule. I don't know how all of the David upon his throne again, if that's literally David or if that's Jesus Christ as the descendant of David, the really the offspring, the root and offspring of David. But whoever's ruling upon the throne, the disciples, it seems to indicate, will rule the 12 tribes. Places of great authority. Now, before you get eager to have that position, remember what these men sacrificed. They gave up, many of them, their homes. Many of them spent very little time with their families. Many of them sacrificed greatly. All of them died for the faith. And they sacrificed, and they gave, and they served. And many of us are the direct result of their faithful testimony and witness. And yet Christ promises to these men places of authority. Now you say, Pastor, I don't know if I like that. If I, man, the different levels of authority. Can I give you a quick example of that? Go to Matthew 25. And this is found repeatedly in the Word of God. That authority is directly connected to our reward in stewardship. Matthew 25, and if you would please, just one verse, verse 21. And this would just be one example. The Lord, as He's rewarding in this parable, the faithful servants... This actually is said two times, but i just give you one example. Look at verse 21. To the one that had been given five talents and brought with that five talents five other talents. Verse 21, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. All right? That's what he did. That's what's being commended. Now here's the reward of that faithfulness. I will make thee, what's the next word? Ruler. Ruler over many things, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And it is apparent in the Word of God in multiple places that all believers will be with Christ, but not all believers will reign with Christ in the sense described in these passages. Now, is it about having some title, Mr. So-and-so, in this precinct of heaven? No, it's just a greater opportunity to worship God and serve God. Remember, take away all the pride 
remove all of the, the veneer of what we think of when we think of authority and think of it in a pure, sanctified setting. I want to serve God. I want responsibility. I want an opportunity to serve Him in whatever capacity He desires. And so proportionately, our position of responsibility and authority will come as a result of stewardship. Now go back to our text there and look now at verse 29. And notice, if you will, what Christ says here now following that promise to these men. He says this in verse 29, everyone that had forsaken houses or brethren, all right, now he's describing these men. How much of these men's families do you see in the narrative of the Gospels other than Peter's mother-in-law? There's very little mention of these men and their family. I mean, they sacrificed greatly uh, to be what Christ wanted them to be. Notice, everyone that's forsaken these houses and brethren and sisters and fathers and and mother and wife and children are lands for my namesake, shall receive an hundredfold. There's that proportion, and shall inherit everlasting life. Number two, not only is there proportionate authority to our stewardship, there's also proportionate abundance. Abundance. If you're taking notes, you may want to jot this down. I don't, I can't do the math myself, but the Bible says here in this passage that a hundredfold means God will give ten thousand percent interest on what we give to Him. What that means for heaven, I don't know. If you give Him a a minute of your day, if you give Him some of your resources, if you give Him your talent, what is 10,000% of that? What's that look like? I don't know. But Christ says that it will be a hundredfold. I don't know of any other investment that promises that. Let alone promises that that 10,000% given will continue forever. That's the abundance that God gives, and it is proportionate. By the way, 10,000% of zero is what? Still zero. See, God can only multiply, and God can only bless little that you give Him and little that I give Him. But He can bless it in an abundant fashion. The same God that created everything out of nothing, ex nihilo, as we would say, can't bless nothing. He can't multiply nothing. He needs your little. He needs my little. And with it, He can do abundant things. Have you ever thought about before, uh, maybe you've had this experience where just for a few moments you've had like unlimited whatever, maybe at a buffet line or you know some crazy sale in a store where you can buy any and as much of something or whatever you want. Have you ever had access to something where you, it's just too much? I only can handle so much in this life. You can only eat so much food. Some of you have, have figured out where that threshold is and maybe gone beyond it. You can only travel to so many places You can only do so much in this temporal existence. But take us out of the framework and the boundaries of this body and this life and the few years and few limited things that we can do and be and put God's blessings in the context of eternity. There's no limit to what we can experience by God's grace and for His glory. And so God offers to us abundant rewards. May I encourage you tonight not to forget the abundant amenities that God offers many of which are directly correlated to our proper stewardship in this life. Second and lastly, so look down, if you will, verse 30. So there's a proportionate level of giving and blessing from God. God can only give us in proportion to what we first offer to Him. But notice now at the end of the verse, he says, verse 30, the end of this text, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Secondly and lastly, we must also understand that there is a prerequisite to the rewards that God gives us. A prerequisite. First or last, because they forgot what should be first. One of the things I look forward to in heaven more than anything else is God recognizing and rewarding some, quote, nobody that nobody's here heard of in this life that receives the greatest reward. I, I, I hope I'm close enough to hear God say well done to that person and recognize and we all turn to each other and say who was that again I guarantee the one that God most uses for his glory in that moment will probably not be the famous people we read their biographies and 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 quote them and refer to them it's going to be somebody that nobody except him knows what they did for him I man I look forward to that day not for me but for that person and for the glory of God and what a joy Uh, that will be. But there are some prerequisites. What's a prerequisite? It's a thing that is required as a prior condition for something else than to happen or to exist. And God has given us 
some prerequisites to glory. Now what I want to do, or to reward, what I want to do very quickly, there are five crowns listed in the Word of God. I want to just give them to you. We don't have time to look at all of them in Scripture, but can I just list them for you, maybe jot them in your notes tonight, and I will give you at least one reference with them that you can look up on your own time. I want the crowns that I might, again, bring glory and honor to Christ in eternity. The first one is, number one, I didn't put these on the slide, the crown of life, the crown of life. And if you would, put beside that James chapter 1 and verse 12, the crown of life, James chapter 1 and verse 12, and also Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. James 1, 12, Revelation 2, 10. And go and look at James 1, 12 and Revelation 2, 10 and read it and see what God requires to receive that reward. Basically, the crown of life is given for faithfulness to Christ either through martyrdom or persecution. Now, this is one, <laughs> to be honest, I, I don't know if I want to miss it, but I wouldn't mind missing the martyrdom or the persecution that precludes it, that, that allows me to receive that in that moment. But man, what a glory to be counted worthy, to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And to allow that place and that experience and that suffering to bring about reward that God gives to those who have sacrificed for Him. But may I remind you tonight, the crown of life doesn't just come by default. There's some requirements for it. And may we be motivated tonight and thankful if God gives us that opportunity. Number two, the crown of incorruption. The crown of incorruption. Uh, let's look at this one. I think this one's worth looking at very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul here contrasts the temporal crown that athletes and kind of like the Olympics going on right now in our country or in our world, they strove for a temporal crown. But notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 24, right? So the second crown is the crown of incorruption, the crown of life. Number two, the crown of incorruption. Verse 24, know ye not, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 9 and verse 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, all right? Theirs was just kind of usually some olive leaves, something that was more, uh, would begin to fade and falter in just mere days. He says, I therefore, so, <laughs> excuse me, so run not as uncertainty, uncertainly, but so, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body, bringing in subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The crown of incorruption. This crown is given for determination, discipline, and victory in the Christian life temperate, keeping under my body. Man, it's worth it to have discipline. It's worth it to have structure in your walk with God. That positions us, that allows us to qualify for the crown of incorruption. Number three, the crown of rejoicing. And I give you just a couple of references there on that one. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. Jot that down if you would. The crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, and then also Philippians 4 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, Philippians 4 and verse 1. The crown of rejoicing. This crown is given for pouring oneself into others in evangelism and discipleship. This is, this is for the soul winner. This is for the discipler. This is for the person that's reproducing in others what God has already done in their lives. Paul talks about the church at Thessalonica, ye are my crown of rejoicing. I don't know if number three is a literal crown. You know, the, the verbiage in the Word of God is a crown. But if it were me, I'd rather see the people. That, that's the crown right there. Whether with that comes sort of some sort of physical representation of those people, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a jewel in the crown, some have supposed, for each person or something of that nature. But, but it is a crown of rejoicing. I want to see people in heaven that would not be there but by the grace of God through me being a minister and testimony to them. How shall they hear without a preacher? They have to hear the Word of God to believe it as we studied this morning, that crown of rejoicing that comes. Number four, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. And if you would, jot down beside that 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. 
The crown of glory is the fourth one. And put, if you will, down 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. And in that context, Peter is talking to the under shepherds, to the pastors of local churches. And this crown is given for faithfully representing Christ in a leadership position. You're honoring and you're you're respecting who Christ is in your place under that, and then those you're responsible for. I believe even uh, our children, even uh, other places of spiritual influence that we have, as well as those that formally lead in the local church, that they have the potential to receive this crown of glory. And I find it fascinating, we won't look at it, but in 1 Peter chapter 5, it talks about that a pastor, an under-shepherd, is not to be greedy in order to receive this reward. Uh, And so it's a contradiction, it's the opposite of what often we strive for and we desire, and it is achieving that which God has promised. Now, can I give you a quick principle, and I share this in my discipleship with the men that I've had the privilege to go through with. Would you go to Matthew chapter 10? And my own theory is this, that this crown of glory is not just for the the pastors and the visible, uh, you know, maybe deacons or others that uh, have some sort of formal title. I think the crown of glory is available to every believer. And I think it's found here, if you look for it here in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 41. I think it is possible to receive all five of these. Uh, Obviously, the first one carries with it some prerequisites that some are out of our control, persecution and martyrdom, but all that live godly will suffer persecution. So I think without being too loose with it, I think any of us could apply or could uh, meet the requirements of any of these crowns. But here's the principle in this one. Look at verse 41. He that receiveth the prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth the righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And I think it's possible, and I I would say without stretching in any way, the principle here is this, that we also can share in this reward uh, as we partner with those that God has given spiritual leadership responsibilities. And I think some of the ones who will receive this reward most worthily by the grace of God will be those that were not the leader, but those that supported and partnered with and were such a support and encouragement to those that God had called to lead. Lastly, number five, there's the crown of righteousness. And the reason I'm giving you this list tonight is I want you to see that there are prerequisites. There are things that you have to do or be to receive these. I catch in my own heart and often in the hearts, it's just by default. If we're in heaven, we just start getting rewards. And it just just naturally comes. That is the most anti-biblical. There's no foundation for that. There's plenty of foundation for what we're submitting to you this evening. Number five, the crown of righteousness. And if you would put down beside that 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. And I believe, let's look at that one and we'll finish as far as Scripture tonight with this one. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and if you would please, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and if you would please, verse 6. And this is probably one of my favorite crowns that God promises but obviously any of us can qualify for it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul knew he had mere moments left on this planet. Verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day. And if that verse stopped there, we'd probably be okay with that. I mean, Paul was pretty phenomenal believer. God used him in a great way. But notice what he says, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. This fifth crown is given for joyfully purifying and readying oneself to meet Christ at his return. Just every day, could be today, could be today, and I'm pure and I'm ready and prepared and I am eagerly anticipating his return. God values that so much that He says, I will, re- I will reward that as we faithfully look for Him. I've met many believers who have, in my view, and I think biblically have said a very ignorant statement, and I've caught myself thinking this as well. And that is this, my works do not affect my relationship with God. I know what they mean by that as it pertains to salvation. But my works directly impact highly impact 
not just my present fellowship with God, but for eternity. My eternity will be different, better or worse, as a result of how I properly steward. In Matthew 25, 21, Christ does not say to the believers, well said, well believed. He says, well done. Well done. And as we are doing what God has called us to, we can experience His full blessings. I don't know if you've been watching any of the Olympics, but my wife basically drops everything when the Olympics come on, and she just loves to watch it. She grew up always watching as a kid, and she just is fascinated by it. Uh, and uh, so we have been watching some of it in our home. But they've begun to give out awards, and they have the podiums, right? And they got, you know, the Browns, the Browns, yeah, that's not even on a podium, all right? The, the bronze podium, uh, and then they've got the silver and then in the middle, I think usually highest, is the gold. And you, it's just, I love to see it. You know, with it being in Russia, some Russian person is hanging, they kneel down, or they lean over, and they put it around their neck, and then they stand, and it's not just about them, is it? it it's about the moment that follows that, as the gold <laughs> hangs around the neck, and everybody stops, and the national anthem is played. I mean, just, and many times you see that, that competitor just weeping, that they're able to represent their country and they're able to be in that moment and, and on behalf of their country claim that victory. Do you know that all believers will not have that moment in heaven? 1 Corinthians 3 is clear. We will be saved, yet so is by fire. There's, no reward, there's nothing left. It's just the grace of God. It's just what He has given to us that we worship and glorify Him in for all of eternity. But there's nothing left that we have given to Him, that we've used what He has entrusted to us to bring glory and honor to Him. See, salvation is about God's work for us. Conversely, rewards are about our work for God. Belief determines our eternal destination. That's where we will be. Behavior determines our eternal rewards, what we will have while we are there. Just as there are eternal consequences to our faith, so there are eternal consequences to our works. What we do with our resources, including our time, our money, our possessions, will not just matter 20 minutes, 20 days, or 20 years. It'll matter for 20 trillion years. Have you thought about that lately? Man, that I mean, just boggles your mind. And my commitment this evening is that this church and my family and my life is always living with 20 trillion years in view. As little as I can grasp that. God says, think about it. Make decisions upon that. Thinking of the long tomorrow and doing so in a way that pleases and honors God. We, uh, Brother Josh has been sick the last couple of weeks and we started a new choir song. And uh, the song, last week we started was the song, In the Light of That City. Miss Joanne was sitting right here. If some of you weren't here, she passed away last night. Sitting second row. Sang that song with us. And she's there now. She's there now. Are we stewarding in light of that city? It's real tonight. It's powerful. And yet we go about our days, we go about our weeks, and we just squander and we just waste. And maybe we just sit on it. Invest it. It's a smart investment. There are levels to rewards that are coming, and it's worth it to invest in the cause of Christ. Will you tonight allow your stewardship to be strengthened by an unyielding faith that God and what He's doing is the best investment? And number two, will you allow your stewardship to be strengthened in the belief that there are differing levels of rewards, and God wants you to experience all of them, but you must come and you must steward in a way that pleases Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You tonight for Your Word. Lord, I thank You tonight.